Um, in this video, I will talk about electrically controlled wetting as a tool to, uh, to drive uh, liquids in microfluidic systems. So this is an electrical approach where we use electrode arrays to drive uh, liquid droplets. And um, I will first talk about the implementation of uh, so-called digital microfluidics, which rely on the electro electrically uh, uh, controlled wetting method that uh, I previously introduced. I will talk about uh, system components and I will talk about R&D results that, uh, that we made back in the day, a long time ago, when I did my master thesis and bachelor thesis on this topic with uh, the BioMEMS group at uh, the Academy of Sciences in Hungary and also uh, Peter Pazvain Catholic University. So credits also go to them for this, uh, uh, for these slides and, and the results that I will report on. First, device components. First, of course, you need an electrode array for which you have a bunch of different layouts and they can be open or closed. By open, I mean that uh, on the one side you have uh, a substrate with the electrodes on it and on the other side you have nothing, you have air. Um, and the way these uh, electrodes can be laid out is um, with a catena where you have a ground wire piercing through the droplet and then you bias the driving electrodes and you move the biasing forward, thereby moving your uh, droplet, as is shown uh, here. Um, when you activate the electrode, the droplet will extend and start to wet the activated electrode. You remember the contact angle decreases in the presence of an electric field. Another open design is uh, when you have the ground and the biased electrode uh, in the same plane next to each other and you get a similar effect but uh, it's slightly less uh, efficient than the catenary approach. A closed system can be made with two plates in a way that uh, the uh, opposite plate is grounded and you have the driving electrode uh, on the substrate side and uh, this one obviously results in, uh, in a more energy efficient system. And you can also have the driving electrodes on both sides. So this one, uh, this approach would assume that uh, the top plate has a conductive layer, but it is not patterned. This one is the most expensive where both sides have patterned electrodes and this one must be transparent. So you have the substrate side. Substrate is typically non-transparent, uh, but the uh, the opposite side, the counter electrodes, they must be transparent. And um, we have two phases, phase one being the, the water and phase two being the inert fluid, which can be air or, or an oil like silicon oil. And um, with this uh, two plate, uh, both plates uh, patterned approach, you get a very uniform electric field, so this one would be the best layout, but also the most expensive. It's kind of like uh, driving the liquid in between two capacitor plates. And um, also important, obviously, are the power supply and your control unit. Typically would be a microcontroller and some power electronics for turning the, the uh, actuation on and off. It, it is typically high voltage, relatively high voltage, meaning uh, 100 volts, 200, 300, that sort of thing. Materials for the electrodes, we can use gold, aluminum, platinum, carbon, and uh, indium tin oxide is transparent, so that uh, can be used on the counter electrode side. The dielectric layer you need to use for electrical insulation, uh, such as uh, silicon dioxide uh, that I talked about in the, the previous lecture. Uh, or in the, the advanced fabrication lecture. Uh, Perylene, which is an industrial uh, insulator material, and silicon nitride and so on. Hydrophobic layer is necessary to, uh, to uh, make the actuation easier, to decrease um, wall adhesion, to decrease the contact angle of your droplet and make the driving more effective. 
We can use Teflon, for instance, or other fluorocarbons for a hydrophobic layer. Fluids themselves are typically water for your sample and uh, an inert fluid for the filling. Now, um, for the electrode, you must uh, consider several parameters. Electrode height, the distance between the electrodes, and, um, and the boundaries. So, boundaries between the electrodes are often made in an interdigitated way, so you have uh, something like uh, interdigitated um, finger, like uh, when you cross your fingers, fingers are digits in Latin, and, and so interdigitated means uh, locked fingers, basically, where you decrease the distance between the electrodes by having uh, a very narrow gap, and uh, having them uh, as close as possible uh, to each other, which would be your uh, distance between them. And uh, you can apply, in this case, uh, it has a sinusoid uh, profile applied uh, to, to this um, uh, gap between the electrodes. Also, is not marked on this, but the electrode size is likewise an important feature that you need to take into account, because um, if the distance between the electrodes is too large, droplets can get stuck. If the electrode is too large, it is not uh, really in alignment with the size of droplet that you want to achieve. So consider that the size of the droplet determines, or the size of the electrode determines the size of your droplets. And uh, if the pitch distance between the electrodes is too small, then you can get a, a breakdown of the insulator and uh, you can get hydrolysis. Um, so how to counter uh, these problems is that you use interdigitated electrode designs, you use um, um, an inert filling liquid, and you use a modulated signal to uh, mitigate um, electrolysis at uh, direct currents. So you can use a, you can use a square wave, sine wave, uh, triangle wave, and other sinusoid uh, excitations for the driving signal. Um, in terms of uh, how these uh, systems are made, first, you have to make the electrodes, which uh, in our uh, approach was made by a liftoff process. So on the base silicon dioxide, uh, thermal oxide, uh, we deposited resist. On top, we deposited aluminum and uh, dissolved the resist and the patterned aluminum was left um, on the surface, then uh, an insulating oxide was deposited, contact windows were opened by selective etching, and then uh, liquid Teflon was uh, deposited by spin coating, and again, um, the contact windows were covered up by uh, tape, and uh, was removed. Uh, when we removed the tape, then the contact windows were left open. You can use various uh, hydrophobic layers, but uh, Teflon is, uh, is a popular and easy choice. And uh, here's something that uh, you should note, although I guess uh, it is obvious by now. You can um, generate um, this so-called electrowetting effect even on a metal electrode, but um, you will be likely to get electrolysis and, uh, rather than actuation. So this is a comparison between uh, open and closed uh, systems, uh, single plate and uh, two plate systems. So if you remember, you can have a design where you have the actuating electrodes in one plane and either you have something or you have nothing opposite it. So advantage of, uh, of the uh, two plate system would be a more uniform electric field. So the actuation speed, in theory, is higher for the open uh, one, uh, single plate system, but the, the droplets are more likely to get stuck and you can, uh, you're more likely to have uh, um, um, cross-reactivity between your different samples and, and contamination of your samples. So it is uh, more favorable 
to use a closed or two plate approach for, um, for microfluidic reactions. Um, what is easy on an open uh, electrode array is uh, evaporation and mixing, whereas just actuating droplets and uh, separating and dispensing is more easy in a, in a two plate system. And what we have on the one side is uh, uh, a silicon substrate with uh, patterned electrodes, insulation and hydrophobic layer. And on the opposite side, we have uh, either um, a grounded electrode plane, or as I said, a patterned uh, electrode plate. But uh, typically you would have a grounded electrode plate or in some systems, just uh, a covering plate which has uh, no biasing uh, or it is not grounded, it's just uh, floating. And this one here is a co-planner approach where you have grounded electrodes on one side and uh, the driving electrodes on the other side of the droplets. Um, in my thesis work back in the day, I first made a linear actuator array, which was a, a two-dimensional matrix. And at every step, I would uh, ground one side and, uh, and actuate the other, or I would ground one set of electrodes and uh, actuate the next one, and thereby move the droplet forward. So um, how this works is you ground all of the electrodes and you apply the excitation to the two electrodes in front of your droplet. Capillary forces will uh, act uh, to to uh, to keep the droplet in place, but your uh, uh, electromotive force acts to uh, pull the droplet forward. So, when the resultant is uh, pointing towards the direction that uh, you want to drive the droplet in, then you have movement. Otherwise, uh, you can get stuck. Now, um, dispensing. Dispensing is, of course, a very important uh, operation in any microfluidic system. And the advantage that uh, digital microfluidics can have over, for instance, pipetting robots is that here the volume is very well metered. The size of your uh, electrode determines the volume that you dispense. Uh, so how it's done is you have here the mother droplet, out of which you extend um, a daughter droplet by turning on the, the big first electrode and the second one after it, you elongate this uh, daughter droplet all the way until the next electrode, and then you turn this one off in the middle. That is called pinching. And thereby you get this uh, daughter droplet, which is really well metered by the size of the electrode. So extrusion, pinching, cutting and extraction of the droplet. And um, so the advantage over continuous microfluidics is that uh, electrode size quantifies the droplet size, uh, but pinching is, uh, is rather challenging to implement in practice. So splitting works really similarly, only that in this case, you have one large droplet that you elongate on multiple electrodes, and then you turn off the one in the middle and if you did it right, then your uh, big droplet will separate into two smaller ones. Um, this requires three to five uh, cells uh, or, electrode, uh, or electrodes. And uh, again, it needs the, the pinching motion to be realized, but um, the capillary forces hold together your droplet, which you must overcome to cut them. So these... Uh, the cohesion between uh, the water molecules is really strong and to overcome it you need a very good system and uh, that is also why you need the hydrophobic layer to uh, decrease the, the work of adhesion. Uh, however, in mixing, uh, cohesion actually is on your side. So here uh, we have uh, a big droplet formed from two smaller droplets. This is actually my thesis work. 
And then what you do once this is uh, formed is you need to move it back and forth to uh, apply a mixing motion. Or you can apply a, a high frequency excitation back and forth is also a way to, to shake the droplets. So you merge and then mix. It can be done in a back and forth motion. It can also be done in a way that you uh, separate and then mix and then separate again. It can also be done uh, in a it can also be done in a circular motion uh, on a circular electrode array or in a, in a loop. However, the disadvantage is that any dissolved uh, particles can deposit onto the electrodes or between the electrodes while shaking. Uh, so this sedimentation, this is a, a risk when uh, trying to move uh, droplets with materials inside. So, um, in our particular uh, system, which we did back in the day, the substrate was silicon, electrodes were made of aluminum, insulation was silicon dioxide, and uh, we also had a PCB to uh, connect to these uh, actuator arrays, so this was just wired out, um, and then the wires were connected to, uh, to um, a linear connector or in this case, just a pin header. Uh, electrode layout was coplanar, so biased and grounded electrodes were in the same plane. Electrode size was one millimeter. There was 20 to 60 microns of uh, distance between the electrodes. And we had a jagged uh, electrode interface, something like, like this between the electrodes. A 100 volt square wave signal was used to drive the droplets and uh, actuation frequency was around uh, two and a half hertz. So um, you could drive these droplets uh, 2.5 millimeters per second. This one is a slightly more advanced uh, system where the goal was to have um, a chip for, for an actual micro reactor and um, these, uh, these would have been the reservoirs for sample input and the electrode around would be the, the path for, uh, uh, for sample actuation and for uh, performing the, the liquid handling operations. So um, there were two high voltage drivers, um, National Instruments DOC card for uh, data acquisition and for controlling the, the system here. And um, the, to this uh, layout, you could connect a, uh, a syringe pump to uh, feed in the liquid and, uh, and do the operations on this cartridge. So what we did was actually implemented um, in the industry by uh, Illumina or at that time it was called Advanced Liquid Logic. They had a printed circuit board with uh, a number of uh, input-output ports on the covering plate and uh, was a, a printed circuit board with electrodes uh, for the actuation. Uh, electrode pitch was uh, 1.125 millimeters, so it's uh, larger than, uh, than our system. And the uh, plate format was uh, 384 well microtiter plates. So what this means is uh, these microtiter plates have uh, a number of wells, each of them the same size, into which you can put samples. And liquid handling robots and pipetters are typically designed for these uh, plates. So this one is the size of a 384 well plate with the distance between the reservoirs matching that uh, size format. It had 20 reservoirs and um, they could work with 300 nanoliter droplets, which would be quite challenging to make with uh, uh, liquid handling robots, or at the time anyway. This was 2008 and uh, 2013 when I did my work. Um, then uh, 300 nanoliter droplets were quite difficult to create with liquid handling robots. That's uh, personal experience. Uh, but the whole system 
cost around 10,000 euros with the uh, actuation and, uh, and, and the peripherals that come with it and $500 for one cartridge, so quite uh, pricey. But uh, it could be used for uh, DNA amplification. Uh, here's another example where uh, they worked with microbeads, which is uh, interesting for uh, DNA uh, purification and uh, so for for extracting DNA from uh, a sample uh, of uh, of various um, um, different uh, particles like blood that has uh, different uh, biomarkers in it, and you can extract. Uh, what you need by magnetic particles. Problem with magnetic particles is that uh, they tend to uh, aggregate and uh, in this case um, that was used to, and, uh, to the advantage of the system they were uh, collected on uh, wires that were used as electromagnets in this uh, system. And uh, this one is the layout, so this has uh, a grounded counter electrode where indium tin oxide is used as the, the electrical layer. It's uh, an acrylic glass and Psi top is the electrical insulation and also the, the hydrophobic layer. Paraline on the bottom side is additional electrical insulation. Electrode side, size was uh, 700 microns and the distance between the electrodes was 10 to 40 microns. So you see here the electrode layouts. These are the driving electrodes, and this one is your capture cell for the magnetic nanoparticles or magnetic beads. Um, and this one is an example for paper uh, digital microfluidics. So electrodes were printed on paper from carbon and silver or carbon uh, silver uh, mixture. And in this demonstrated application, there is a fluorescent droplet being driven on this uh, uh, actuation uh, array. So we have a, a bunch of electrodes and here's a droplet on them. It's quite interesting because uh, it is relatively cheap to fabricate in comparison with, uh, with other options. And um, they demonstrated um, a detection of rubella immunoglobulin G uh, with an immunoassay. So um, the, the results, uh, what they claim in this paper, are comparable to uh, chromium glass digital microfluidic chip. So chromium glass meaning that uh, this is the, the microfabricated type of system. If you remember, uh, photo masks were made of uh, chromium glass, um, patterned uh, chromium glass systems. And this one is uh, an open source um, digital microfluidic platform, the, the open drop uh, in, in which uh, the driving electrodes are on the printed circuit board and all the technology you can get on their GitHub page. So check out uh, this website if you're curious. Uh, these are the droplets as they are being actuated by a quite high voltage, 150 to 300 volts if I remember correctly. But it is still uh, quite a robust system. You can buy your own or make your own. Uh, you can assemble the, the system yourself. So I talked about uh, digital microfluidics and electrically controlled wetting. Uh, implementation of these uh, uh, test devices, various system components and results from uh, R&D in this video. Mm -hmm.